Hello, and thanks for joining us today for the latest Analytical Cannabis webinar, The Analytical Landscape of Cannabis Testing, Pesticides by GCMSMS. I'm Jack Brudd, Editorial Director for Analytical Cannabis, and I'm here to moderate today's event. I'm really pleased to have Kirk Jensen and Ram Kumar Dambapani joining us today as your presenters. Kirk graduated from the University of Northern Colorado in 2005 with a bachelor's degree in chemistry, after which he worked in the pharmaceutical and nutraceutical industries before returning to school to pursue a doctorate degree. He graduated from Colorado School of Mines in 2014 with a doctorate in applied chemistry with expertise in mass spectrometry, microbiology, and statistics. He then took a position at Osaka University as a research scientist for three years before joining Joel USA two years ago. Ram Kumar has been in the chromatography industry for over 17 years with hands-on and troubleshooting experience. He has earned a master's and PhD degree in analytical chemistry from Seton Hall University with specialization in microextractions, multidimensional gas chromatography, and tandem mass spec, mass spec techniques. He has developed and validated several regulatory compliant methods in the pharmaceutical food and fuels and environmental industries, as well as incorporated method improvement and troubleshooting across a range of separation techniques. Dr. Dan Dapani joined Phenomenex in August of 2014, and he serves as the global product manager for gas chromatography. In addition to managing the GC product line, Dr. Dan Dapani presents on innovations in gas chromatography at various chromatography conferences. Following today's webinar, we'll have a live Q&A session and we'd welcome any questions that you may have. Please ask questions using the Q&A system to the right-hand side of the video player. If you experience any technical issues during the presentation, please contact us using the chat system. And with that, I would now like to hand over to Kirk and Ram Kumar. Hello, everybody. And uh, I'd like to thank that nice uh, introduction. Um, so I'm here from JOL today to talk about pesticide analysis in cannabis matrix using GS, GC MSMS. And uh, the purpose today is basically to show you a method for measuring pesticides in cannabis uh, using gas chromatography, triple quadrupole mass spectrometry, and also to look at some corresponding data from some real cannabis samples. And to that end, uh, this is basically the um, uh, today's schedule. So I'll go a little bit over some introductory material and talk a little bit about the instrumentation. Uh, and then I'm going to hand it over to Ram Kumar, and he's going to talk about uh, Phenomenex consumables that are suitable for doing uh, cannabis matrix um, type of analyses. Uh, and then I'll go into the experimental, talk a little bit about sample prep and the analysis conditions. Uh, we'll look at some results both in cannabis matrix and we'll look at some pure pesticide data in acetonitrile just for comparison. And then last, I'd like to talk a little bit about choosing SRM transitions uh, because it could be a really critical part to doing uh, your cannabis samples and to getting the best selectivity that you can get, uh, that you can, uh, get on a GC MSMS. So a lot of this is already well known. We know that uh, uh, cannabis is being used as a recreational drug due to THC. Um, in the United States, it's listed as a Schedule One drug by the U.S. federal government. Um, however, uh, there is a recent surge in legalization, both here and uh, worldwide. And so with that, uh, there is also a need for analytical testing tools. Um, and so one of those things that needs to be tested is pesticides. Um, and with some jurisdictions, uh, you could be looking at uh, levels as low as 10 parts per billion on the dry flower. So what's the challenge in test testing pesticides? So uh, it's kind of a three-part problem. So you have scientists that are trying to develop new pesticides to increase crop yields. And then you have regulatory scientists who need to test these new pesticides for toxicity and develop testing methods for them. And then you have the compliance lab testing uh, that needs to test all of this pesticide content. Um, and so one of the tools that's really important for doing this kind of testing is gas chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. Uh, and the reason for that is it's a very sensitive and selective tool for measuring pesticides. So just briefly, I'll talk a little bit about the triple quadrupole mass analyzer. Uh, it was developed by Rick Yost and Charles Enke in the late 70s. 
Um, and basically the way it works is if we look at the figure, uh, we have some kind of sample that gets ionized in our, in our source, and it goes through the first quadrupole, and there we select the ion that we're interested in. So in this case, we'd probably be, we'd be selecting the primary pesticide for, say, chlorpyrifos or for um, beta-endosulfan. Uh, and then when it goes into the second quadrupole, we're going to collide that uh, molecule with gas, and that's going to bust that molecule apart. And once it's apart, uh, we're going to direct that into the third quadrupole, and we're going to select the ion that we're interested in. And this is really important because as you break these pesticides apart at certain collision energies, this is where you're getting the selectivity. Um, and so we call this selected reaction monitoring. And we can monitor very specific transitions where we break apart this molecule in the, uh, in the triple quad. Um, and of course, the triple quad also offers you know, a wide range of other uh, scan modes. So you can do a single quad scan, which would provide you with a traditional mass spectrum. Uh, you can do product ion scanning and precursor ion scanning, both of which would be necessary for uh, developing new SRM transitions. You can do neutral loss scans, and you can also do select, uh, selected ion monitoring. So it's very, uh, it has a lot of utility, but it's also very sensitive and selective. So just a little bit about the triple quad that uh, we used in today's experiments, the Joel JMS TQ 4000 GC. It has the fastest SRM switching available on the market. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's going to be so important. Uh, it's, and it's basically been designed for routine quantitative analysis, particularly for pesticides. Um, and uh, it features a, a high speed mode, which I'll also talk about in a moment, that allows you to measure uh, more, more channels, more transitions uh, within unit time, uh, which could be helpful if you're monitoring a lot of pesticides at once. Um, then you can also do trace quantitation in high sensitivity mode. Uh, has toolless ion source removal for easy cleaning. And you can also do EI, CI, and PI uh, if you should so desire. It also features what we call a short collision cell. And this is what's going to make a lot of, uh, what's going to make the thousand SRMs per second possible. So it features two different technologies at work. Uh, the first is, is that um, pulsed ion accumulation uh, allows the ions to be accumulated and then ejected in one quick, clean motion. And so by ejecting the ions all at once, uh, we, get, we get less uh, interference ions, and that's going to help with our sensitivity and our selectivity. The second technology has to do with the kinetic energy control through the quadrupole. And basically what this is going to allow us to do is to do precise measurements where uh, as, the, as the ions go through uh, Q3, uh, we can time the detector. And as, we, as they hit the detector, we will turn the detector on. And then as they, after they are done, we will turn the detector off. And so here's just kind of a visual representation of, of that happening. And so in the, in the gray outlined boxes, we can see that the peaks are eluding, they're hitting the detector. And then after they're done hitting the detector, we turn the detector off. And this would be indicated by the red outlined squares. By turning, turning the detector off, we can eliminate a lot of noise. And this will increase our sensitivity and our signal to noise ratio. Now, I mentioned that we have both a high speed and a high sensitivity mode. And so these are illustrated with the figures on the left and right, uh, respectively. So if we look at the high speed mode on the left, this is just like I showed above. Uh, so we can't accumulate as many ions and we're ejecting them more often. So we don't have the sensitivity uh, that we might have, but this is where we can do 1000 SRMs per second. So we can monitor many more channels simultaneously. If we look at the high sensitivity mode on the right, uh, as, as those ions are being accumulated for a longer period of time, uh, that itself is going to increase the sensitivity, but there's also a longer period where the ions are not hitting the detector. And so we can keep the detector turned off and uh, it further increase our sensitivity by reducing our noise. 
So now I'm going to get a little bit into the experimental on how to prepare your samples. Um, so uh, basically we purchased just some recreational cannabis from a local dispensary and we did a basic sonication extraction um, in 15 minutes uh, in 10 mils of a nine to one solution of ACN DMA. Um, I have done some studies where I did just acetonitrile, and I found that by adding in some DMA, uh, you'll get a much better uh, extraction for some of the pesticides um, as in, compared to just doing acetonitrile by itself. And so after we sonicate for 15 minutes, we, we centrifuge the mixture, um, and then we're going to do a dispersive solid phase extraction. Uh, this is going to pull out a lot of the interferences that are in the cannabis matrix. And uh, cannabis matrix is a very complex matrix with lots of different kinds of chemicals. You also have the cannabinoids and you have the terpenes. And we want to try and remove those if possible because they can really um, cause the signal to deteriorate uh, if they're present. There will be too much going on. Um, and so the, the DSPE that we used uh, was a, a mixture of four different kinds of sorbents, uh, magnesium sulfate, PSA, C18, and GCB. Uh, if you want to maybe increase the recoveries a little bit, uh, you could do a DSPE without the C18 and the GCB. You may lose some recoveries of other pesticides, but you might see some increases uh, in some of those hard to get pesticides. And so then we take the final supernatant and we, and in this particular experiment, we spiked uh, um, 10 microliters of our standard solution. Uh, this might be where you might spike either a control or an internal standard for measuring if you so wish. And so now that I'm done with the sample prep, I'm gonna turn it over to Ram Kumar and he's gonna tell you about some of the consumables that Phenomenex offers for doing pesticide analysis. Thank you very much, Kurt. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ram Kumar Dandapani. I'm the Global Product Manager for Gas Chromatography here at Phenomenex. If you want to reach out to me or if you want to learn more about the products discussed in this presentation, feel free to contact me through phenomenex.com slash chat. And I'll be there to help you or my colleague who is in technical team will be there 24 seven to help you. Next slide, please. So here are a couple of challenges related to pesticide analysis, specifically with GC uh, analysis, right? So the primary and uh, the most uh, uh, problematic thing with pesticide analysis is the expansive list. As Kirk mentioned, there are going to be a lot of pesticides which are different in their chemical properties. So choosing the right column and the right extraction solvent and the extraction procedure is very important to get good uh, peak response as well as better recovery. Uh, the second challenge that people commonly face is the semi-volatile nature of the pesticide. Uh, so because of the semi-volatile nature, the pesticides can actually adsorb to many portions in your GC, be it the inlet or be it the column. So there is a necessity for a premium deactivation both in the inlet as well as in the GC column to prevent adsorption and to get higher response for the peaks. And then uh, the third challenge that I wanted to discuss is activity and breakdown of analytes, specifically analytes like Endrin, DDT can actually break down if there are active spots in your liner, as well as active spots in the column. The way to mitigate this is to go for a premium deactivation in terms of liners, as well as column. The next method development step that we could adopt is a pressure pulse in the inlet. So actually you push the analyte fast into the inlet and through the first few meters of the column so it doesn't spend too much time in a hot zone. So uh, uh, that would actually help reduce breakdown. Uh, the last part is about sensitivity issues, especially related to later eluting analytes. So providing a pressure pulse in the inlet would also reduce the inlet discrimination, thereby giving you better sensitivity for later analytes. Next slide. 
Before we go further and talk about how these uh, are uh, important uh, for pesticide analysis, let's look at a GC column. Here is a GC column cross section. As you could see, there are three specific layers within a capillary wall coated GC column. The outermost layer is basically the polyimide, which gives the flexibility and temperature stability to your column. The middle layer is fused silica. It's basically a pure glass that has to be deactivated. The type of deactivation in the second layer dictates the sharpness of your peak, and it also helps to get lower breakdown of active analytes. The third part is basically your stationary phase. Having a uniform stationary phase and adequate selectivity from the stationary phase is going to help you get better separation. Next slide. So now let me walk you through a couple of steps on how GC columns are made. Specifically, I'm gonna focus on premium deactivated stationary phase like ZB 5MS Plus, which is used in this application. So the first step in making a GC column is to wind the column in a cage. So as you could see here, traditionally customers request either a 30 meter or 15 meter length. So in the first step of the process, we wind the column in a specific cage. A traditional oven can fit a seven inch column while there are also smaller ovens that might need five inch. So based on that, the first step in making GC column is to wind the column. Next slide. So the next step is very important specifically for active compounds like pesticide analysis. The deactivation in your column is very important. So it's like coating the walls with paint. So if you want to coat walls with paint, the first thing I would do is actually scrub the walls and then add a primer. And over that, if I add a paint, then it's going to stick very well. In similar fashion, we would actually create surface roughness through chemical reactions. So you're basically scrubbing and creating that surface necessary for coating the paint. Right. So the next step is the primer. So that's basically the deactivation. For ZB5MS Plus, we use a premium deactivation so that you get to conceal all the selenols within the surface. And then when we coat the column with the stationary phase, the coating actually adheres very well and it gives you uniform coating throughout. Next slide. So here is a column getting coated in a bath. As you could see on the left-hand side, uh, the column is completely coated, while on the right-hand side, you could see a partially coated column. The way we control the temperature and also control other parameters within the bath actually helps maintain a constant and a consistent coating of the film throughout the column. So once you get consistent coating throughout the column, you get higher efficiency for a given column dimension. So both these steps are really critical, uh, the type of deactivation and also slow and steadily coating the column so that when you, when you have the column, it's ready to handle challenging analytes like pesticides. Next slide. So basically the premium deactivation is the most important thing in terms of pesticide separation. We are looking at a 5% phenyl type selectivity. Again, there is a subtle difference between a 5% phenyl phase versus a 5% phenyl aralin phase. GB5 MS plus is a 5% phenyl aralin phase with a superior deactivated stationary phase. Uh, and also the stationary phase is extensively cross-linked through our engineered self-cross-linkage process. So you could confidently use it on a mass spec based detection without bleed. Uh, and the, the most important part is the premium deactivation. Because of the premium deactivation, uh, the cylinders are completely covered. So you get sharper peaks uh, for active compounds. And the next thing that's most important in your GC is also the liner. Uh, many times people focus on the 
gastromotographic column for the method development, but uh, the liner is equally important here as well. Uh, when you look at the liner, that's the first part. The inlet is the first part where your sample meets your instrument, right? And also the inlet is at higher temperature, many times in split and threadless injection, right? So it's important to have those surface really deactivated so that the analyte doesn't break down in the inlet or it doesn't get adsorbed to the liner. So Zevron Plus liners or premium deactivated liner, they are made with a spray coated process. Um, and also they have a thicker coating of deactivation. So compared to traditional liners, Zevron Plus liner lasts longer as well as they have this premium deactivation, which provides an inert environment for the analyte in the inlet. So they are remarkably inert with superior sample protection. And then they come pre-installed with O-ring so that you don't have to touch the liner when you install. And uh, you could use the packaging to install the liner directly. Uh, also, they are available in multiple geometries for you to explore. So feel free to explore the geometries before you settle on a specific uh, liner design. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll pass it to Kurt for the next slide. All right, thank you very much, Ram Kumar. Uh, so now that he's talked about uh, some of the GC uh, consumables, I'll talk a little bit about the analysis conditions. Uh, so as you can see, we are using the Zebron ZB5 MS Plus. Uh, we want that to you know get the you know, really get the nice deactivation and the sharp peak shape uh, and the low bleed. Um, he also mentioned that we're you know we're looking at pulse splitless. In my experience, when doing pesticide analysis, pulse splitless really, uh, really takes the cake here for putting the pesticides onto the column as quickly as possible. Um, I find that if they if they hang out in the inlet too long, uh, a lot of those pesticides degrade or break down. Um, so that pulse splitless is going to be really important. Uh, for the inlet liner, uh, we are using that Zebron Plus, and it's uh, just the four millimeter ID, single taper wool on the bottom. Um, as Ram Kumar mentioned, these come pre-installed with O-rings on them, so it makes changing them out super easy. Um, and also, uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to touch the liners or anything. You can just put it right in your GC. Uh, we're looking at a custom um, temperature ramp, so we're going we're gonna to initially go at a, a, pretty high, like about 35 degrees C, and then we're going to come down to 5 degrees C per minute up through the mid-range. Um, and then at the end, we'll increase again for a total GC runtime of 23 minutes. For the mass spectrometer, uh, most of these are very basic settings. We're doing EI at 70 EV, um, 100 microamps of uh, ionization current. Um, we're going to be doing peak dependent SRM, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and I'd like to highlight that we did the high sensitivity mode. So if you recall from the earlier slide, in high sensitivity mode, we are, um, we are accumulating ions for a longer period of time. And during that accumulation, we have the detector shut off so that we can increase our sensitivity. Uh, we automatically set the group time, but um, and so this is the uh, this is the channel time that you'll see on the right. Uh, setting it automatically usually works very well, but if you want to do more targeted analysis, uh, you may want to set uh, your channel time uh, in a custom way. Um, so, for example, I have the spiroxamarine uh, that fifty milliseconds for the for the three ions, but methyl parathion for at 60. Uh, this is because methyl parathion is a little less uh, sensitive um, in the instrument. And so by increasing the channel time on it a little bit, I can get it more on par uh, with some of the other uh, samples. So briefly, I'd like to mention peak dependent SRM. So in the figure on the top, we have what we call conventional SRM. And so particularly, I'd like to look at like group two. And so basically in group two, you have several, you have seven ions that are all eluding at the same time. 
Um, and so you have to monitor all seven of those ions for the entire group time. And that means you need to split the channel time equally between those channels, or even if not equally, you still get less total channel time to split between the seven ions. Now, if we look at peak dependent SRM on the bottom, uh, if we look at peaks B, C, and D, um, once they're done eluding, we can see that there's a little overlap with E, but by the time we hit peak F, we're not monitoring A, B, C, or D anymore. And so that allows us to dedicate more channel time to uh, each ion within the group time. So without any further ado, let's get into the results and we'll look at uh, the performance in cannabis sativa matrix. So first, these are the SRM chromatograms at one part per billion for just a few select pesticides. So for something like chlordane or chlorphenopyr, we get very good selectivity and sensitivity. Uh, for the cyflutherin, uh, we're seeing all four uh, isomers come out very well. Uh, MGK-264 also coming out very well. Uh, so even at one part per billion, we're getting very good sensitivity. For calibration, uh, these are the same sets of compounds, but as you can see in general, linearity looked very good uh, from um, you know, one part per billion all the way up to 100 parts per billion. Uh, for some samples, once you start to get past 50 or 100 parts per billion, you'll start to see some saturation effects. Um, uh, when that happens, uh, you can just uh, you can just take away one of the higher standards and just do your linear calculation through the lower standards. But generally, the range in linearity is very good for all the pesticides we measured. So there's a lot of data to look at here. So let me just walk you through it. Uh, basically, I have a list of the pesticides that I measured in this particular study. Uh, it's based on the California list. Um, so we see that things like acephate and acetamiprid uh, at the top there uh, don't perform very well. They have a red X. We, we didn't observe any peaks. Uh, those, those two pesticides are typically better on something like LCMS. But if we look at like the chlordanes, um, we can see that we're, we're penetrating all the way down to one part per billion uh, very well. Um, and those are compounds that are typically difficult to do on LCMS, but do very well on GC. And so just as a general rule, we do see a lot of green circles. This means that we're seeing uh, both the quantitative and the two qualifier ions uh, at a signal to noise of at least 10. Um, so there are still some like cinerin and the pyrethins that are a little more difficult, but in general, uh, we do see a lot of the pesticides. Just to look at more of, uh, of some numbers, so uh, in, in, the, in the green, we have linearity that's better than 0.99. Uh, linear, only a few uh, were between 0.97 and 0.99, but at least all uh, that we measured were 0.97. Um, if we look at the third column uh, for IDL, uh, any sample that was measured at one part per billion, we measured at eight replicates to test the in, uh, instrument detection limit. And for any pesticide we could measure at one part per billion, we can see that the, uh, the instrument detection limit is less than one part per billion for all of those samples. Uh, range, as I mentioned, was also very good. Uh, for most of the samples that we measured, uh, the range was um, one part per billion to 100 parts per billion. For some like uh, carbofuran or chlorpyrifos, we see even better range. Um, for some of the ones that didn't work so well, uh, the range is definitely a little, uh, doesn't penetrate down to the one part per billion, uh, such as the permethrins, but still very close. So out of 51 pesticides, we only, there were eight that we couldn't detect, and I mentioned a little bit about those. Um, uh, of 43 detected pesticides, 36 were observed at one part per billion or less. And this is important because back at the beginning, I mentioned that 10 parts per billion is sometimes the action level uh, for pesticides. When we go through the uh, extraction process that I mentioned earlier, uh, we basically are diluting by an order of magnitude. So that one part per billion is really the target. Um, and I really think that a lot of the compounds that didn't quite make one part per billion could be further optimized. And I'll talk a little bit about how that might be possible. 
Uh, I mentioned that the chlorinated pesticides, such as chlordane and cyfluthrin, cypermethrin, performed well. Uh, they all had at least one isomer that we could measure at one part per billion or less, and that those are typically difficult for LCMS. And there's a few pesticides like acetamiprid and acephate that do better on LCMS. Um, uh, several ions still suffer from interference peaks. So this is something I found doing uh, matrix, uh, cannabis matrix experiments is that uh, the matrix is so complex that you're getting a lot of different interference ions. And so uh, a couple of things that could be done is that uh, you, you could look at a, a more complex cleanup step. Unfortunately for some uh, compliance testing labs, doing a more complex uh, sample cleanup uh, might cost a lot of money or time. And so one other area that could be useful is looking at different SRM transitions that are more selective and are less um, susceptible to those interference ions. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. And before that, so before that, I would like to just briefly show you the performance in pure acetonide trial. Uh, so I didn't go all the way up to 100 parts per billion because you can see at 25 parts per billion, I'm measuring almost every single pesticide uh, with all of their qualifier ions. Uh, definitely, if we look at the one part per billion column, we see a lot more green, which means we're seeing uh, both the qualifier and the quantitative ions at at least a signal to noise of 10 to 1. Um, our linearity... Um, only three compounds were less than 0.99, and all of them were 0.98 or better. Uh, range as well, um, we, we get grain, great range. If we look at, we were even getting the pyrethins to come out uh, at 25 and 10 parts per billion. So obviously the matrix is having a huge effect on the, on the um, per possible performance uh, available from pest measuring pesticides. So just uh, a quick takeaway from the acetonitrile performance, every compound tested was observed at some concentration. So uh, when we get to 25 parts per billion, we're seeing every single compound that we measured in this study. Um, basically, that's because we're looking at a very simple solvent. Uh, so retention times are predictable, and that means that you can adjust uh, custom channel time a lot easier. You can uh, give each channel more dwell time, which uh, results in better sensitivity. Also, you're getting less interference ions, so uh, you're not having to, those ions aren't having to compete with uh, ions that uh, um, are not even pesticides. Um, so some, some compounds such as acetamiprid, again, I mentioned that that was an LCMS compound, so those tend to exhibit pretty significant tailing, but they are measurable at, uh, at some, uh, some concentrations. And chlorinated pesticides such as cyfluthrin and cypermethrin um, work very well on GCMS. And uh, uh, when we only deal with a simple solvent, we can really uh, get much lower uh, detection limits for those compounds. So I mentioned so about choosing SRM transitions, and this is how this is one way we could address the interference ion problem. So interference ions particularly happen at like lower uh, mass to charge ratios. You have many compounds that end up breaking down. And so if you, you're looking at transitions that are less than a mass to charge ratio of 100, uh, then you might see significant uh, interference compounds. So when we choose our SRM tran uh, transitions, we have a way that we optimize um, we have a way that we optimize these transitions. So first we measure uh, some single quadrupole data. So we basically collect a basic mass spectrum and the software will pick uh, the most intense precursor ions from that measurement. And it will do a product ion scan at different collision energies. And so the results of those um, are shown in this figure for just a few pesticides. And if we look at propachlor, for example, um, the ion in red is the transition from mass to charge 120 to 77. And uh, if we picked a collision energy of 20 EV, then we'd be maximizing uh, our peak area. And so the software will automatically take the most intense transition. So the red one would be the quantitative ion, blue would be the next, uh, be the first qualifier, and green would be the second qualifier, and so on. However, uh, sometimes these don't 
uh, even though these work very, very well in simple solvents, once they have to compete with other compounds, they may not be the best transitions anymore. So here's an example. I have beta, beta endosulfan, um, which I have five different transitions for. And if we look at the red, green, and blue transitions, we see a single, we see a single peak at that particular retention time. Even though there are some other ions present, there are no interferences going on that we know of, and we do get good peak shape. But once we look at the uh, orange and purple ions, uh, we can definitely see there is a major interference, uh, two major interference ions obscuring our beta, beta endosulfan uh, peak. And so we need to find out uh, some better transitions if we want to use uh, more transitions for beta endosulfan. So if we look at the, at the uh, retention time right around beta endosulfan, um, uh, we can see that there are seven overlapped compounds that, are, that could possibly be contributing. And I've, put, I've separated those chromatograms out on the right. And so you can see there's a variety of different compounds. Um, however, if we look closely, uh, DDD and DDT uh, are both very close to the retention time, and they also have the same, a similar pattern. If I compare them by, side by side, uh, we can see that, um, uh, that indeed the DDD and DDT uh, appear to be overlapping. And if we look at the transitions, which I've circled in black, uh, we can see that in beta endosulfan, we have 235 and 237 going to 165 for those two transitions. And indeed, uh, we have 235 to 165 for DDT and DDD. Um, and so that appears to be our overlap. And uh, we can confirm this by looking at the mass spectra for both of these uh, pesticides. So if we compare DDD and beta endosulfan, uh, we can see that uh, they have 235 and 237 and 165 uh, in both mass spectra. Now, those may not be the major ions, but because we're measuring that transition and that pesticide is co-eluting, uh, that's why we get the overlap. And in the case of beta endosulfan, it's a particularly weak pesticide to measure, so the DDD will simply overpower it. So one way to address this is to, is to pick other SRM transitions. And so you would have to do this uh, without the, using the optimization software, because it's always going to pick the most intense transition instead of the most selective transition. So if we look at beta endosulfan, I can tell you that at uh, mass to charge 339, we don't find that in DDD. So that might be a good precursor ion to use. Uh, we could use 277, we could use 143. These are all peaks that are in beta, and beta endosulfan and that are not in DDD that would make, uh, that may make very good transitions um, for beta endosulfan. And so just to kind of, um, recap about SRM transitions. Um, several SRM transitions can and should be determined for analytes of interest. So when we do our optimization, we pick five different transitions and then we end up using two or three. If you have five transitions available to you, uh, anytime that you have a what appears to be uh, an interference ion, you could just swap out that transition and remeasure. Um, however, uh, if you're switching matrices, you may find that you need to find new optimal SRM transitions. Um, you'll get different kinds of uh, interference ions, and you may even find that doing different types of cannabis, because you have different uh, terpene profiles, you may have different cannabinoid profiles that could be contributing. And so you may need to look at some different SRM transitions, even within measuring just cannabis. Um, once you have those optimized transitions, uh, we, you can save those in custom libraries and quantitative files on our JMS TQ 4000 GC. So let's say you have two different types of uh, cannabis that you are measuring on a regular basis, and they need to have different transitions. You could have a library for each of those different, uh, excuse me, cannabis samples and then just uh, switch it out easily and you could, um, and you wouldn't have to uh, spend any extra analysis time. Um, 
uh, trying to figure out which transition to use. However, that does mean that you need to do a lot of the SRM optimization up front. And in the end, using these selective transitions is the real power behind triple quadrupole GCM SMS. The selectivity is what allows us to ignore a lot of those interference ions and to really uh, get the sensitivity that we need for measuring pesticides. So now I'd like to wrap up this talk. Uh, I hope that I've showed you that triple quadrupole mass spectrometry is an effective tool for pesticide analysis. And even during every, everyday chemical analysis, uh, you, can do a lot of, you can do a wide variety of different kinds of things with triple quadrupole mass spectrometry. Um, and our JMS TQ4000 GC uses patented technology to help increase the sensitivity and selectivity. Um, and that also helps us get the fastest channel switching in the industry at 1000 SRMs per second. And that's all thanks to the short collision cell and the associated patents that go with it. Um, we have high sensitivity mode available for the short collision cell that allows us to measure low part per billion pesticides uh, in cannabis matrix. And last, uh, I hope that the discussion on choosing the best SRM transitions was informative and that it will help you tailor your uh, cannabis analysis to be the best that it can be. With that, I would like to thank my colleagues at Joel USA, John Dane, Chip Cody, and Koji Okuda for helping with this project. I'd like to thank Ram Kumar from Phenomenex for being part of this discussion and, and for always offering to help us uh, with our uh, targeted analysis. And lastly, I'd like to send out a thank you to Paul Winkler from SciX. He was the, the man who originally sent us uh, the, the uh, Phenomenex products and the uh, cannabis samples for doing this study. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you.